Hi, I'm Michaela Angela Davis, and I'm coming to you from Sedona, Arizona. So um, I may come in and out, but stay with me because I'm going to stay with you. Um, I identify as an image activist and a writer and a producer. And I most recently completed collaborating with Mariah Carey on her memoir, The Meaning of Mariah Carey. And I'm currently working on a project called The Hair Tales. And all of my work is um, really centered around the identity of Black women and women of color and expanding the narrow narratives that have been um, enforced around us and who we are. And that's what really has me so excited to be here and be in conversation with Lloyda and Lloyda and this film, this beautiful, urgent, intimate film. So um, I want to use all this time for us to talk about through the night um, and really urge all of you to watch it and be in it. It's not even like watching this. This film was an experience. I felt at a certain point, like one of those children on the floor in the daycare, like so much memory, so much like black girl memory um, was ignited in watching this film. So without any more talking for me by myself, um, I would love to invite you all to help me first thank Lloyda, but bring her right up into this moment, into the screen. Um, Lloyda Limbal, my sister, thank you. Um, thank you. And, you, and, and Lloyd is in Puerto Rico. So as I said, I may, I may be coming in and out. She may be coming in and out, but we spiritually we're, we're connected. Even if the, even though our technology may um, turn on us a little bit, right? That's right. Thank you so much, Michaela. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, even energetically, when you shared that you were in Sedona, it's like, like, that's right. You know, um, this, 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 right now I feel like that's, the choice right we have to choose life and figure out how what that means you know for for us and for us individually our families but collectively um thank you thank you for being here with us and for the kind words about the film i'm so happy to hear you say that you felt like one of the children in the daycare <laughs> you know it's it's so so first i think part of it was just the actual filmmaking the um, intimacy and the lighting, uh, it would seem like it was almost, almost, it was almost nighttime all the time. Mm -hmm. And this kind of um, beautiful lull that had, that was energized with the urgency of the topic of the moment. It's, it's a very beautiful and rare um, tone that the film had that, I felt like I was with those, like really on the same level as those children and remembering my own daycare of lying down on a mat, you know, in some dim room with some, you know, black women's hands helping me eat and get my hair done. And so it was very touching on a, on a sense memory, but um, that, the way that you were able to let us get into the lives of these women was really special. What brought you to this work? Because, you know, I, you hear this term of it was a labor of love, but this film was a lot of labor and love. It, it was a lot of labor from the women. We saw the labor of the women and we saw the love of the women. But what for you, what what had you... Um, what brought you here? What, what, what made the story urgent for you? Mm -hmm. um. 
Well, many things. I, I learned about uh, Nuno and Patrick daycare through an article that I read online. Uh, and I, in reading the article, I was sort of immediately brought back to my own childhood uh, and really uh, brought back into thinking about my mother and her experience raising us uh, as a single mother who worked the night shift uh, and who raised four kids in New York City making minimum wage. Uh, and now sort of being a mother myself, uh, being a single parent, working as well, you know, I sort of sat there with this article in front of me, reading the stories of women who are working all kinds of hours um, and really navigating so many different violent terrains. Yeah. Um, and it, it made me wonder like how my mother did it. And not necessarily from like a financial or logistical standpoint, but I, I wondered like about her interior experience and mm -hmm. like how she felt and, you know, yeah what what was happening inside of her right and um and so that sort of brought me to this very personal intimate space myself right of my own childhood of my own mother uh and as a filmmaker you know my subsequent thought was this is the story of so many of my sisters and i don't really see this story anywhere i don't see these kinds of stories be told and so that was Really the point of departure wanting to create something that could feel like an honest, curious, patient portrait of our everyday, most intimate lives. Well, uh, achieved, <laughs> you know, um, particularly, again, this, what, I, what was striking, um, there were so many things, but the exploration of Black women's memory um, was something that I i didn't know that I missed it or that I was longing for that until I was really in this film. And then also, again, this idea of labor. I felt like Nunu was always wiping, working, and, and you know, tucking and putting things away and sweeping and cooking and chopping. And, and so many women in my life, not my generation, but the generation before me, that, that was, they were in constant movement. I thought like I never really saw my grandmother sleep. Like there was always, and you know, and even if you didn't have that experience of being in that kind of daycare, there was, there was something about women's work about a mother's experience that was really universal. And this notion of rest kept coming up like, like th there was no rest and even the children talking about it. And I'm, I, wanted, I wanna talk to you about that concept about, I mean, I remember her saying, I'm very tired. Um, I'm afraid if I rest, I may never get back up. Um, um, if, and then there was one line, she was like, eventually I'll sleep. And it was just that, um, speak to me about that because that, this, this, this theme of not resting or never having rest um, seems so, so prevalent. Um, and just something I feel like we've just held for generations. Like never, like you just die. That's when you rest. Like when the diabetes yeah. or that other, whatever the thing is that gets you probably before you reach 65, that's rest. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, there, there's so much there for me that I wanted to explore with the film. You know, I, I think about this particular community, right? And the history of black women's labor in the United States indigenous women's labor, Latina women, but specifically, you know, thinking about like Marisol is Mexican, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and also like a lot of times in the U.S. when people talk about Latinx communities, I think it's important to raise up that the, the, sort of the two communities that created that concept of Latinx, right, as a political mm -hmm. identity were Mexicans, Mexican-Americans, Chicanos, and Puerto Ricans. 
right? These are people that have a very long, complicated history with the United States, right? So if you take Black folks, Black American folks, Indigenous folks, Puerto Ricans, and Mexicans, right? These are all these people have all been colonial subjects of the United States government, right? Um, and as such, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. our everyday our existence really has been framed within, uh, uh, you know, extraction, right? We are mm -hmm. our labor is exploited, our literal life source is uh, exploited for the benefit of the larger society of the economy of capitalism, right? Um, and so. You know, and that's, you know, a, a point of departure for me. And it's important, it was important for me to expose this system, right, of mm. capitalism, which I think oftentimes we don't talk about enough in the United States. Um, you know, even within conversations about racial justice, we don't talk about capitalism and name it and, and sort of really expose it for its cruelty and its violence. Uh, and the reality is that in the United States, the way that capitalism functions, the sort of late stage capitalism that we're in, sleep is a luxury. Mm -hmm. Luxury that only a select few, the, the lucky ones, you know, are entitled to. In mm -hmm. the film, no one gets more than two or three hours of sleep, right? No one, Marisol sleep, Shanona doesn't sleep, Luna and Patrick don't sleep. Uh, and so there, there's that sort of physical harm, that, that material harm that is done right by the, the conditions of this merciless economy and what it demands of us. Um, you know, for me, it was one wanting to make that visible, make that sort of out it, right? Like expose it, right? The system. Uh, and then on the other hand, you know, for us to make legible for us that this is in fact our reality, that we are exhausted, that we are drained mm -hmm. because we're being asked to literally sacrifice ourselves and our families and our well-being. Um, because I think what, you know, in many ways, I'm very concerned about the societal stuff, but at the end of the day, I'm most concerned about how we see ourselves and how we see each other within our communities mm -hmm. uh, and the ways that we internalize, right, what this larger society tells us about ourselves. You know? and so I'm sort of really interested in creating work that helps sort of cleanse us, if you will, of these things that we've internalized, right? Because we then believe that we're struggling because of some personal shortcoming yeah. or some mistake that we made when in fact this is systemic and structural, mm -hmm. right? And then if there's any shame to go around, it's on the structures, on the system, on the society, and shouldn't be our, you know, ours to hold. But we do in fact hold it, right? We we internalize it, we feel the shame, we feel the guilt, we shame each other, mm -hmm. we guilt each other, which is something that's very particular to the experience experiences of single mothers of color you know yes, a lot yes. of criticism a lot yes. of judgment a lot of opinions yes and so you know for me it was like wanting to put that on display that like in fact you know everybody in the film these folks are like doing everything right like they're doing everything you're supposed you're told to do by the society mm -hmm. but in essence what that amounts mm -hmm. to is work yourself to death you know literally Literally, I mean, Literally. you you humanized the, this indictment that you of of capitalism, um, and I was going to you, you pretty much answered the the inquiry is you still were so um, tender with the women's stories, and as such, we were able to um, have a human experience with that indictment. It wasn't in your typical sort of documentary where you pretty much articulate what you just did, what, which is what you would do in conversation like this or on a panel, you just showed the lives and the system that you are indicting also sets us up for what you just said. It has taught us to criticize ourselves, each other, and somehow think if we just work harder, um, and you're working harder than everybody else. And that's what also got so clear is how hard 
everyone is working more than anyone else and how there is um, no time to even, those tender small moments where they're with their children, at, you know, Marisol on a seesaw or like a, a, a birthday party or just a meal together just seems like a, a rare and precious thing. And there's, a, there's this underlying, I mean, Nunu talked about it, like missing her own children, like this, this history of us missing our children while we're taking care of everyone else's children, family needs, um, and what that looks like in the now. Um, you did that masterfully. How did you, and so there's one question about, um, or just speaking to that, but then also this notion of childcare and self care were happening at the same time and how, um, you know, Nunu was willing to work with her arm pretty much falling off. Like, like how can you just stop the pain so I could just keep working? Like that was so profound. Um, and the, so these notions of caring for others, child care and self care. How do you, how did you care for yourself not just in this, because when you explore it in this way, I'm sure so many, all the feelings, right? So the emotional work. And then also you're, a, you just said you're a single mother. So how did you take care of yourself and how is the notion of self-care and child care, community care, how, how was, how did you factor that into the, into the film? Yes, um, you know, and there's something too that you said about the, the piece uh, around the incitement, but it, it's still so tender. And I, and I would say, you know, the indictment is there. It's really critical and important for me. But again, the, the, the real quest was to create something for us. And so, mm -hmm. you know, with that as my North Star, I was always thinking about given this reality, given the harshness with which this world treats us, right? What is it that I want for us? And, and to your question about the self-care, it prompted me to really have to think about like, what is it that I want for myself, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in answering the piece around what is it that I want for us, you know, quite literally from my mother, you know, who's in her 60s and, you know, worked really, really hard her whole life under really harsh conditions. You know, I want ease. I want rest for her. I want tenderness. You know, I want that for Nunu and Patrick and Marisol and Shinona and them babies. I, and I want the babies to grow up desiring these things and feeling like they these things are their right. Yeah. Um, and that they are worthy of them. Because again, that's the piece, you know, which comes into play for me. At 41, realizing like I had a very, I have still, you know, um, a very complicated relationship to the idea of like, you know, it's hard for me to accept that I have needs and that I need help mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of having internalized all the things, right? Um, and so there were a few moments while I was filming and, and sort of in the space and having conversations um, with Nuno and with Mari and with Shinona that, you know, I remember like there was one point where there was a conversation between Nuno and Mari and I was like, that's right. I'm so glad that Mari has Nuno, you know, in her corner. Um, she was there to really um, quiet down all the noise, you know, and all the criticism that people you know, in her job or in her family or, you know, just in the neighborhood might be throwing at her. And then I was like, right, like I am worthy of that too, right? Like this idea that we're worthy of support and care and this kind of very ancient notion of like mothers need mothering, right? Uh, and in that community, that's a huge thing that I saw, right? That, which I think is a model um, for us at large and certainly in this COVID-19 moment, just this idea of, Nuno and Patrick are taking care of the children, but the children are taking care of Nuno and Patrick. The children are taking care of each other. 
yeah. the, the mothers are taking care of no no mm -hmm. you know there's just care happening across so many different relationships and so many different kinds of ties that I think one are also ancestral to us and folks of color because the nuclear family has not been you know the way right or the only way that we have structured ourselves in community and family you know for numerous reasons right like going back to slavery and you know not literally not being able to keep families intact right um you know if you think about immigrants immigration undocumented communities think about queer folks like we're constantly having to recreate family and redefine family in order to survive quite literally um and to me this daycare is yet another example of that you know and and just the, the idea that i think you know I, I hope serves as inspiration and there's something hopeful in these times of we are all capable of caregiving that's right, right? we all need care mm -hmm. and we're all capable of giving care and that care is the strongest and it is at its absolute best when it is collective care right um and that we don't have to be sort of um, stuck in this one model of the nuclear family right and if you're just not in that then it's just you against the world on your own that hasn't ever been our way you know and, and so in some ways i'm just not like putting forth a new idea it's just once again making legible what i consider to be one of our many geniuses right and, and, and one of the many ways that we lean into life right the, what was so it was so important that this film came through you meaning this notion of you know women essential workers capitalism you know the minimum wage all those issues that have been you know looked at from other kinds of people but through your eyes i was i also was really moved by how much beauty there was in the film and and just in the daycare like the disco lights and the colors of things and how careful the artwork was put up and how um sweet the space felt and how you took time to like linger on a peach or gold balloons or you know or the um the way the little girl's hair was tenderly cared for that what we didn't get was you know just a tragedy you know film of our pain and how hard we work that was so clearly there but it was all this love and like you said the community this this village of care and you know when she was picking greens i was like that you know that like and this teaching the 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 teenage girl became very interesting to me at a certain point because she was the question like what's this generation going to like how is she going to be leaving the news you know doorstep and her mother crying at her graduation i don't know what had, had mary Saul finished high school or i didn't know how big of a milestone that was but I just want to really acknowledge how much beauty there was in that film, in the people and in, in your actual film making and how that um, played a part in your telling of this story. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and the, the, the beauty is literally like an extension of how I see us. You know, I grew up in the Bronx yes. and I'm one of those like New Yorkers that love people watch so I literally you know whether it's in my own neighborhood um or not like I I love to just watch us like I love us you know I and I I generally think we're like beautiful and we're like flyest people on the face of the planet mm -hmm. um and so you know and and I think back to the sort of worthiness thing from a cinematic perspective I believe that we are worthy of a patient curious you know, gaze and lens, right? That that I am going to stop, you know, when Nunu is, you know, remembering to go get, you know, the hair wrap for Naima so that yes. in the morning she doesn't have to do her hair, you know, 
or when Nuno is is wiping down the counter, right? That all of there's nothing small, there's nothing insignificant, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and that is a, a bit of a statement around just me feeling like we need films uh, yeah. that show us living, right? Because we have so many documentaries in particular that show us struggling, that show us dying. Uh, and yes, dying. we are struggling yes. and we are dying, right? Mm -hmm. We are also living uh, and we are masters at living, you know, in the face of constant violence, right? And in yes. the face of constant threats, we continue to choose life. Um, and I, it's important to see that and what everyday life looks like is small everyday gestures, you know? It's not just kind of big crises in someone's life. I think it's really important um, to, to balance that out. Uh, you know, and I would also say I want to give like a tremendous shout out to my entire team of collaborators, which was a completely, mm -hmm. you know, women of color team. Um, our director of photography, Nighty Gamas, who on the very first day of the shoot uh, captured so much of the beauty that then became our North Star in terms of the cinematography. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. There was a moment that she captured where a mother is massaging a little, you know, small child's uh, leg. And when we went back in the edit and we saw this moment, we were like, oh, that's it. That is how you make tenderness uh, visible. That's how you make care legible. Yeah. This is what care literally looks like. And so that became, right, like our North Star. Mm -hmm as we were shooting was like always sort of honing in on these very small gestures that are very, very everyday. Um, and then my, my editor, Malika Zuhali Warao, um, who just, you know, was with me from day one. Uh, and we had the most kind of amazing conversations and collaborations and ended up creating this very interesting way to, you know, to your, your comment about tone and, and rhythm of the film. Uh, we ended up actually using breath and breathing as our metronome in the edit. Oh, Literally, like you oh, would sit the there, I, take I, breaths, you know, and, yeah, yes. and I would kind of tap my hands on the on the desk as we were sitting side by side and be like, okay, that shot, this is how long we need to hold it. No, we can cut out of that, you know, sooner. And we would really struggled for very long uh, with the pacing of the film and the rhythm. Mm -hmm. And it was when we leaned into just breath, something that's super intuitive, but also that is the, the mm -hmm. very thing that people in the film sometimes don't have, you know, a chance to catch their breath. You know, it, it, yes. it felt yes, like yes, yes. a way to, you know, yes. there's some justice, some poetic justice in there. Yes. You know, for and, us. and actually it's, it's actually radical to do when making a film about women of color. You keep you've worked the, you, you've used the word patient at least three times, and that is something that I feel is a a radical notion in looking at the lives of everyday women of color to be patient with their lives and look at them and see how those everyday things that they that they do are um beautiful and meaningful and it it's a radical film in uh, but that the fact that you did the uh, as i said it's, it feels urgent but in this very slow patient intimate way a super rare beautiful um feeling it's that's how light that's how a day is right sometimes it feels really slow and urgent and repetitive and beautiful and patient at the same time. Like you're, I feel like your ancestors are just like, you know, saying thank you because I feel like it's a, it felt very now, but I felt like that was a story of generations. So um, before we go, I just want to, um, Thank you again publicly on this public square of Facebook and wherever we are for your beautiful, um, patient, urgent, essential work. Mm. And um, I know that you had an impact um, fund or there was a part of the film that was really helping 
um, essential workers. So for our last bit, can you talk a little bit about that? And um, everyone watching, go to the website and find out how you can help. But that's a great way to kind of get out of here is like <laughs> through the women that are still doing this work as you and I are talking right now. Yes, uh, indeed, right. They couldn't be with us uh, because they're literally doing a toy drive right now for Christmas. Um, in the community, um, but I'm sure they're going to be watching or tuning in at some point. Um, yes, yeah, so in the spirit of mutual aid, when I reached out to, um, you know, Nuno and Patrick early in the, the pandemic, uh, you know, and asked, like, what do y'all need? What's going on? What, what do folks need in the community? Uh, you know, they mentioned that they were doing okay uh scared uh they've been open the whole time uh and because they are caring oh, wow. for the children of essential workers mm -hmm. um but they said you know there was a lot of different needs a lot of gaps uh in the community and so this idea of creating an essential care fund was born mm -hmm. uh and so between uh Nunu, patrick a few other uh providers and parents um they formed a committee uh, we used, you know, the little bit of a platform that the film has given us to raise uh, money. We raised about $70,000 and gave out a round of grants to 13 daycares um, that have been open, caring for the children of essential workers. And now that the film is in theaters virtually um, throughout the country, we decided to reopen that fund so that we could do the same uh, in cities that we are going to be opening the film. Um, and so, yes, I definitely encourage folks, you know, in this time, we now have the language of mutual aid. Yes. We understand that really we are on our own. Um, you know, the government is not coming in to save regular everyday working people. Um, and so that we have to take care of each other. Um, so, yes, like you said, we everything is on the website. Um, also, if you want to watch the film, you can get tickets on the website, uh, which I believe is in the chat. Um, and if you want to um, donate to the Essential Care Fund, we would greatly welcome your donations. That sounds like a great holiday present. Mm -hmm. Hanukkah, Christmas, Kwanzaa, whatever, <laughs> to donate to this fund in um, in the name of all in the name of all the aunties and all the ancestors and all the current. Uh, women working. Um, thank you yeah. so much. And um, I appreciate this work. And um, everyone, give you, be patient with yourself and watch this film. It's worth it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Michaela. This My is pleasure. a gift. <laughs>